morning I want to speak from the subject, Spirit of Faith, Spirit of Love. We recall that John has been addressing a church with an insecurity complex. Some church members had embraced a false teaching known as Gnosticism. And that teaching denied that Jesus came in the flesh and focused exclusively on attaining theological knowledge without any attention to practically loving people. The Gnostics were spiritual elitists, smugly despised ordinary Christians as if they were inferior, unlightened, unspiritual, and ultimately unsaved. And the saints were devastated and deeply unsettled by this false teaching. And the assurance and the confidence that they, were, they once enjoyed before the Lord began choking beneath a flood of doubts and uncertainties about their own standing with God. And so throughout this letter, John has been seeking to reassure the saints, and, and he has highlighted two important evidences, proofs, that God has been at work amongst His people and that they belong to them. And the first proof that John has highlighted is faith in Christ. John has repeatedly highlighted how faith in Christ is, 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 is one of the birthmarks of God's children. And also love, love, sincere love toward the saints. This is another spirit-wrought birthmark among God's children, proof that God lives in us and that we are the recipients of a love that will not let us go, a love that transforms us and conforms us and shapes us after the image of Jesus Christ. And today, what we're going to see is that we don't <clears throat> come to faith and love <clears throat> in our own strength. You don't give a birthmark to yourself. But God, by His Spirit, gives us these gracious birthmarks, these gracious gifts poured out upon us by the anointing of Christ. John says it this way, this is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. How? He has given us of His Spirit. I want you to notice the way in which John says this. John didn't say, this is how we know we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. John says, this is how we know we live in us and He in it, he, and, and, uh, and, and we in Him. He has given us of His Spirit. And that's a really interesting way of saying that. He, John, John could have just said he, get, he gave us His Spirit. That's what he said in John 3, 24. But here, John deliberately, deliberately, uh, 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 listen to this, uses a particular construction known as the genitive partitive construction. Say it with me. Genitive partitive construction. And you may wonder, what in the world is the genitive partitive construction? What is that? What is that? Well, well the genitive partitive construction is where uh, in the Greek, um, uh, 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 a part uh, is, 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 is pulled out of some hole, okay? Let me give you an example. Let me, let me give you an example. What, what, what John is literally saying here when he uses the genitive partitive construction in verse 2 is he, he's literally saying that God has given us a share of His Spirit. God has given us a share of His Spirit. Now, why would John say that God has given us a share of His Spirit. Well, you remember back in uh, Numbers 11, when, uh, when God had, had, had so blessed Moses, the man of God, and, and, and clearly God had done great things through Moses, but at, at, at one point in Numbers 11, uh, God takes a share of the Spirit that He had poured out on Moses, and He actually gives it to some of the other elders in Israel. 
He takes a share of that spirit and gives it uh, to the representatives of all of Israel, looking forward to a day in which God would take uh, a, a share of the spirit anointed uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the man of God has been anointed with Jesus Christ, and he would take that spirit, that same spirit that he anointed Christ with, and he would give it to all his people. So we share in that anointing. In John 20, the resurrected Christ breathed on the apostles, saying, remember, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And why did Jesus go through this whole uh, exercise of breathing on his apostles and saying, receive my spirit? Well, this indicates that, that, that Jesus would actually pour out the Spirit and that He would take the same Spirit that rested on Him, the Spirit of wisdom and the Spirit of understanding and counsel and the fear of the Lord that we read about in Isaiah chapter 11, and He would cause the entire church to share in that Spirit, that He would give us of His Spirit, a share in His Spirit. And in 1 John 2.20, John has already told us that we have an anointing from the Holy One, from our God, that teaches us of the truth. And so the fact, beloved, that, 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 listen, we have seen the glory of the kingdom if we have come to faith in Christ, that we have entered the kingdom if, if we've come uh, by faith to Christ, and, and, and the fact that we have bowed the knee to the king of the kingdom all owes to the fact uh, that, that, that our God has poured out the Spirit upon His people and given you something that you otherwise wouldn't have yourself. If you, listen, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today, that is not something that you gave yourself. If you see light today, that is not something that you gave yourself. If you have the birthmarks of true faith in Christ and love toward the saints, if you want to bless somebody, that's not something that you could have put in yourself, but it is, a, it, it, it is an expression of God's work in you. And that ought to give you great assurance that you belong to the Lord, that His life lives in you and you live in Him. So we come to point number one here, the spirit of faith. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, is a spirit that gives faith. And the first thing we want to talk about and the first thing that John talks about is he talks about a confession of faith. See, we know we, 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 know we live in God and God's in us because He's given us of His Spirit. And, and how do we know we have His Spirit? How, how do we know we have? A lot of people claim to have the Spirit, but how do we know we have the Spirit? Well, there's a particular confession that the Spirit produces among His people. The Spirit alone causes us to embrace and confess the truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And look at what John says. He says, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. And so the first thing John talks about here uh, is he, one thing that John talks about here is the person of Christ. John is saying God has caused us to see something in Jesus that the religious and political leaders of the day and many of the crowds that surrounded Jesus and even some of the members of his own family could not see. Remember, there was a point in the Gospels in which Jesus' earthly brothers couldn't tell, didn't know that he was the Messiah. That there were people all around Jesus that saw him do miracles and, and heard him teach. And, and still, when, 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 when he told them that, listen, you've got to uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood. You've got to be part of me. You've got to be joined in me. They gave up and walked away and said, no, 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 this is a hard teaching. Who can follow it? Messiah or not? I'm not following this. There were a lot of people that thought Jesus might be John the Baptist come back from the dead or maybe one of the other prophets come back from the dead. But, but, but the Spirit of God caused God's people to see that, no, He's not John the Baptist. No, He's not just another prophet, but He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not just a teacher, but God Himself come in the flesh. And, and as I said before, if you see that, flesh and blood didn't give it to you. But our Father who is in heaven gave it to you. 
If you see that, your parents didn't give it to you. The catechism didn't give it to you. New City Fellowship didn't give it to you. A good pastor didn't give it to you. We could have encouraged you along the way. We could have set the gospel before you, but only God can soften your hardened hearts and open up your blinded eyes and cause you to see who Jesus is in His glory. And if you see that today, you ought to praise God for the gift. And hallelujah. And, and so we are grateful. We are grateful for being able to see and make this confession about Jesus being the Son of God. But also John indicates to us here that, that we don't just see Him as the Son of God, we also see Him as the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. <clears throat> isn't, that, isn't that what John says here? He, he, he says, and whoever has seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John calls Christ the Soterra to Cosmo, the Soterra to Cosmo, the Savior of the world. Now the Gnostics in John's day, the Gnostics that were infiltrating the church, they believed that Jesus was a Savior from the world, but they didn't believe He was the Savior of the world. They were spiritual elitists, remember, who believed that salvation essentially came to those who deserved it, to, to those who had within them the divine spark, to those who were, quote unquote, a higher order of humanity who contained within them a divine spark that simply needed to be unlocked with secret knowledge. And what the Gnostics were saying is that God gives grace to those who deserve it. They thought of some people as pneumaticoi, the spirituals that had the divine spark with other, uh, uh, within them. They thought of some other folks as psychicoi, the, the soulish people that potentially had a potential for salvation, but, 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 but may, maybe not really. And then some folk, uh, they thought as sarkicoi, the, the fleshly folk, the folk that, that had no chance of salvation, the folk that had no potential or possible possibility for salvation. And, and they considered the sarkicoi like dumb animals, literally like dumb animals and looked down on them and thought that they were beyond the reach of God's grace. So when John is, is, is saying that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Soterra to Cosmo, the Savior of the world, he's emphasizing that Jesus is not just the Savior of an elite few, not just the Savior of the rich and powerful, not just the Savior of the educated, not just the Savior of the, uh, uh, of, uh, of the, of the high and well-connected, but He's the Savior of the world. All kinds of people. The title Savior of the world is unique in John's writing. It's only used in two places in all of John's writing. In this place, in 1 John chapter 4, and in another place in John 4.42, when Jesus is having a conversation with a certain Samaritan woman at the well, and, she, and, and, and by the Spirit of God, she, 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 she begins to realize who this person is that she is talking to. And she goes back and she tells the people in this Samaritan village, this syncretistic village. Now, now if anybody was considered the sarkicoi, the fleshly ones, the folks that were beyond the reach of God's grace, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be way out there beyond the reach of God's grace. And yet, and yet by the Spirit of God, this woman came and she testified uh, to, to, to her village, come meet a man that told me all I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they all ran out and they heard Jesus for themselves. And, 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 they, and, and they said to him, listen, listen, now we don't just believe based on this woman's testimony. We have heard your word for ourselves. And because, and based on that word, they, they said to Jesus, we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world, i.e. the Savior not just of the Jews, the Savior not just of the elite down in Jerusalem, but the Savior to folk even like us. Savior of the people that folks would even consider to be the sarkicoi. And it takes the Spirit of God to cause us to see that Jesus didn't just come for the deserving, 
that Jesus didn't just come for the righteous, but that Jesus came for sinners. It takes the Spirit of God to cause a person to stop trying to work their own way in and to recognize that I'm a sinner in need of the grace of God and, and to receive of the salvation of God as a work of grace and a work all of grace. Jesus, it takes the Spirit of God to, to help us to see that Jesus came for the folk that the world views as sarkikoi. They would certainly view this woman at the well that way, a woman that had five husbands. That's a type of person that a lot of folk in the church would just give up on and say, there's no chance for a person like you. Here's a person that didn't grow up in the church. <laughs> she, wasn't, she, wasn't, she, wasn't, she, 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 she didn't come up the, the, the way a lot of folk do. She, she was so enough out there. And Jesus uh, sought her out because Jesus specializes in saving the least likely. Jesus specializes in saving the sarkikoi. Jesus specializes in saving folk on the street. Jesus specializes in saving folk that everybody else has given up on. And so if you've got somebody in your life that everybody has given up on and that you might be tempted to give up on, you ought to realize that the grace of God is able to come to them because Jesus is not just the Savior, but He's the Savior of the world. He's the Savior for folk just like that. And it takes the Spirit of God to cause you to have that kind of confidence and to be able to confess that He is the Savior of the world. It also takes, listen to this, it, so, so, so listen, it, 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 also takes, it also takes the Spirit of God. We're still talking about our very first point, the Spirit of, of faith. It also takes the Spirit of God to give us a reliance on love a reliance on love. Look at what verse 16 says. Verse 16 says, so we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. The NIV translation says <clears throat> it this way. It puts it this way. It says, we have come to know and rely on the love that God has for us. You know, it takes the Spirit of God to cause us to see Christ as the revelation of divine love. And not just divine love, but divine love toward us. And not just divine love toward us, but it takes the Spirit of God to cause us to rely on that divine love. You know, it's one thing for someone to come along and to tell you they love you. It's another thing for someone, along, for someone to come along and to demonstrate that love. But it's another thing for a person to have the kind of faith to actually lean on that love and rely on that love. And, and what we realize here is that the Spirit of God, is, it, it gives us the grace to not only see Jesus as the revelation of love, but to also rely on that love. And you know, this is something that the average person on the street, the average person that you meet on the job, the average person out here in the world does not know. I love how Sinclair Ferguson said it. He says, listen, he said, the average person you meet walking in the street will tell you, I believe in a God of love. He said, but don't you believe it for a single moment. He said, the one thing that the man on the street does not do is believe in a God of love. Because if they did, they would not spend their entire lives running from God. If the person on the street believed in the God of love, they would not spend their entire lives hiding from God and rebelling against God. If they truly believed in the God of love revealed in the sending of the Son, they would throw themselves prostrate before God in worship and adoration and serve Him with unending praise all the days of their lives. It takes the Spirit of God to cause a sinner to stop running from God. And, 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 and it takes the Spirit of God to, to make a sinner stop deluding themselves with idols and distracting themselves with idols and to actually turn toward the Lord without fear of being crushed. But when you know because of Jesus Christ that your warfare with God is truly over and that God's warfare with you is over, 
that he has sacrificed his own son in order to put away the sword, and that he's embraced and loved you as truly as he loved his own son. When you see that by the Spirit of God, you will not fear any condemnation. You will not fear punishment. You will, not, you will stop running away from God. And in Christ, when you see the Father running toward you with his arms stretched out wide, not letting anything stand in his way, you will run toward him and run for him. I wonder, and, I, and, and, and listen, I, 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 I know this was just a parable, but, but, but just, just come with me just a little minute in your sanctified imagination. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how the prodigal son felt not only when he saw his father, but when he saw his father running for him. The, 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 the scripture says when the father saw his son a long way off, he started running toward him. Lord have mercy. And I wonder how that, that, that son that was still covered with the stench of the pigsty, that was still covered with the mess of the world, felt when he realized that the father, listen, didn't just accept him, but the father accepted him eagerly. That the father didn't just tolerate him, but the father loved him deeply. That the father didn't just receive him, but the father received him with joy. And when you read it, listen, it takes the Spirit of God to cause you to realize that. It causes you to, it will cause you to rely on the love of God. To have confidence with your standing before God. And it will cause you to stop running away from him and start running toward him. In a humble cottage on the seashore, a fisherman lay dying. His pastor sat beside him, and he says to him, Are you sure you are in the love of God, William? Raising his elbow, the old man pointed seaward toward the mountains in the distance through the open window. He asked his pastor, Look at those mountains. Are those seven stones still there? pastor said, yes, they are still there. He said, are uh, uh, the twin maidens and the wolf rock, is that still there? And the pastor said, yes, yes, they, they are still there. And the man sat back on his pillow and the dying man said the words of Isaiah 54, 10, the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that have mercy on thee. Lord have mercy. If, oh God, if, listen, listen, if you think Mount Everest has been there a long time, if you think that's everlasting, that ain't got nothing on the love of God toward his people. And, 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 and that's the kind of steadfast love that we must come to rely on. It takes to, let the Spirit of God helps us to know that, that God's love is not going anywhere. That God's love is stable and firm and secure and the, the love revealed at the cross will outlast the mountains and even the hills. So, 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 so we have a spirit of faith and finally, listen, we have the spirit of love. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of love the spirit of love. I won't be able to hit everything in this passage. John, when he, when he, when he, when he lists out these things, when he writes this letter, that's, this is a densely packed letter, but I, I'm going to hit just this, this part right here. In verse 21, uh, John says, and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Then he goes on in 1 John 5, 3, in the next chapter, he says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And listen, he says this, and His commandments, he's talking about love now, because he's just defined what he means by, by, by this commandment. This commandment we have from him is loving our brothers. He said, and His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome. In other words, they, they, the, 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 the word that's literally used here means a heavy weight. It means a, a weight, and, 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 and what he's saying is he's saying here, look, 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 loving one another ought not to be an irksome thing to you. We, we, we've heard throughout the letter that the mark of God's life in us is when we love one another. It's one way in which the invisible God makes his presence known in our lives, but John is telling us something very important. He's saying the Spirit of God makes sacrificial 
love a delightful privilege and not merely a burdensome duty. The Spirit of God makes love toward one another a delightful privilege and not merely a burdensome duty. The Spirit of God will make love not get on your nerves. Because sometimes, come on somebody, sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes loving other folks seems like an irksome thing. Especially when the folk ain't all that lovely. But it takes the Spirit of God to give you a sacrificial love that looks past your own convenience and sees the joy in someone else's life. My late Aunt Judy's favorite hobby was cooking. And y'all, she was good at it too. She was good at it, she was good at it, she was good at it. Prime rib and roasted potatoes, and turnip greens, and you just name it. She could cook it. She even had an email address. Judy's cooking too. And she would spend hours watching cooking shows and pouring through cooking books and my late grandmother's recipes and slaving over a hot stove, perfecting all kinds of recipes. But you know, there was something strange about my Aunt Judy's favorite hobby. Because my Aunt Judy, for those of you who may have known her, suffered from a debilitating back condition and also suffered from rheumatoid arthritis. And so cooking was a painful process for her. Bending over a hot stove, mixing ingredients up in, in, in a pan was, was, was not an easy thing for her to do. And, 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 and most people that knew my Aunt Judy know, knew that, that, that when my Aunt Judy would cook a big old spread, a big old meal, she wouldn't even eat most of the stuff she cooked. She, she would spend hours slaving over this hot stove and, and, and mixing up stuff in, in the bowl, and, and she would make it, and she would spread a spread out there, and then, and then she, would, she would sit back and drink a cup of water and have a couple of crackers and watch us eat it. And... and, and my question is why would a person with rheumatoid arthritis and a debilitating back condition that didn't even really like to eat most of the food that she made, why would she continue having cooking as a hobby? Why would she give herself to that kind of hobby that cost her so much pain? And then I finally realized she was invested and addicted to the joy that her cooking brought to others. Aunt Judy didn't care about the food, but she was addicted to the smile that it brought on our faces when we ate her food. I remember when she traveled all the way up here to Grand Rapids, Michigan from Nashville, Tennessee, just to make some prime rib and to give me a plate on it during on the occasion of my graduation from seminary. And, and, and she came up here and she, she spent all this money and spent all this time making this food and, and she was standing up there with her cane and, 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 and I remember I got that first plate of prime rib and I was about to go out and greet the rest of our guests and she said, hold on now, don't go nowhere. They all called me Doc from the, at home and she said, now Doc, you stay right here. I said, well, what do you want? She said, now, I made this food, now let me see you eat it. <laughs> Lord have mercy. She said, she said, I made you this food, and you're not going anywhere until I see you eat it. And then I said, well, whoa, 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 why, why would she want to see me eat it? Because she wanted to see the joy in my face. She wanted to see the delight in my face as I ate her cooking. Because, she, because my Aunt Judy had attached her joy to my joy. And, 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 and listen, it wasn't a big thing for her to travel all the way up from Nashville, Tennessee and slave over a hot stove because she was looking past that to the joy that it would bring somebody else. And it takes the Holy Spirit to give you that kind of love, to connect your joy to somebody else's joy, to, to, to listen and say, it might cost me something, but your joy is worth the cost. Oh, it might be a sacrifice, but your blessing is worth the sacrifice. And I'm so glad that the Father looked past the pain. The Lord Jesus Christ looked past the pain. And it said the, the, the cost might be high, but, but your joy and your blessing is worth the cost. 
Oh, Isaiah 53.10 says it this way. It says a strange statement. It talks about the Messiah. It talks about his suffering. And then it says this, but it pleased the Lord to crush him and put him to grief. And that might sound weird to you. How in the world could it please the Father to crush the Son and to put him to grief? Well, the Lord, the Father, did not delight in the agony of his beloved Son, but he was pleased by the joy on the other the side of the agony. He was pleased by the blessing that the agony and the sacrifice would cause, would go, would cause his people, and the life that it would bring you, and the joy that it would bring you, and the grace that it would bring you, and the freedom that it would bring you. And so it pleased the Lord to bruise him because he saw that you would be saved and I would be saved through the bruising of the son. It pleased the Lord to bring chastisement upon his son because he recognized and he looked at you and he understood that that by his stripes, you would be healed, and I would be healed. And ain't that good news? You see, the Father knew the cost would be high, that the cost would be agonizing, but the Father declared that it was worth the cost to see us saved. And so, we must exemplify that kind of love to one another. When we see another saint in distress, we must see it as an opportunity to love, an opportunity to see someone blessed, an opportunity to attach our joy to their joy. We, we, listen, listen. We, we, we shouldn't see love just as have to. We should see it as get to. I don't just have to bless this brother or sister, but I get to bless this brother or sister. It's my privilege to bless this brother or sister. When that, when that basket goes by to give the benevolent offering, and I know that that, 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 that money goes to, to bless other people and, and pay folk rent that, that, that find themselves in rent trouble and, 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 and lift folks out of poverty and, and it gets folks out of a tough situation, boy, what a privilege. What a unique privilege. What a blessing. Our Lord said it is more blessed to give than to receive. What a blessing we get to, we, we, we get to experience. And, we, and, and you know what? is more blessed to give than to receive because when you give, you're more like the Lord. When you love, you're more like the Lord. Listen, what, what in the world did the thrice holy God ever really get from us? But the Lord has done a whole lot of giving. And he said, look, I want you to exemplify this love to the world. I want you to show the world what I'm like. I want them to know that I'm a blessing kind of God. I want them to know that I'm a loving kind of God. I want them to know that I'm a forgiving kind of God. I want them to know that I'm a God that reaches down to folk that are way down low. And I pick them up high. And he said, I want you to do that for one another. I want you to exemplify my love for one another. I want you to see that my love is perfected among my people. And I want the world to know that I'm a good and a kind God. Ain't God good to us? And he's worthy of all our praise. I'm done, New City Fellowship. Praise the Lord. And we're going to get out of here on time. The gospel is good. Our God is good. He's been faithful to us, New City Fellowship. He's paid a high and heavy cost to see us blessed. And I'm so grateful that it was not a begrudging payment. Lord, I'm so grateful that God didn't clench up his fist and fold up his shoulders and turn his back on us. But the scriptures say he, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And I just want you to look at, I just want you to look at your own self and think about you and your sin. And I just want you to remember, look, that the Father saw you in your distress and he saw you in your rebellion. He saw you in your sin. He saw you in your darkness. He saw you in your mess. He saw you out there in the world lost and without him, without a hope in this world. And it still pleased the Lord to bruise him, to see you saved. God is good. God is good. I say it often, he's better to us than we realize. He's better to us than we realize. He's better to us than we realize. 
He's better to us than we realize. When, when, when we're sitting there in our chairs and we're thinking about 10,000 other things in this world, I'm so glad that He's still better to us than we realize. When, when we're going our own way and we're not even really thinking about Him the way we should, I'm so glad that He's still better to us than we realize. I'm so glad that even when we were in our sin, God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, still running from Him, Christ came down here and He died for us. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of gospel we have. God is a mighty and a good and a kind God, and we ought to give Him all the praise. Let's stand together. Let's stand together.